Daniel Mignot is the Craig Reynolds Professor of Sleep Medicine in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University and the Director of the Stanford Center for Narcolepsy. He is recognized as having discovered the cause of narcolepsy. Dr. Mignot was born in Paris, France, and he is a former student of the École Normale Supérieure. He was named Professor of Psychiatry in 2001. He has received numerous awards for his work, including a 2023 Breakthrough Prize in Life Sciences and is a member of both the National Academies of Sciences and Medicine. He has also discovered, he, Dr. Mignot discovered that narcolepsy is caused by an immune-mediated destruction of hypercretin orexin neurons in the hypothalamus. He's also been my doctor for over a decade, and although I may be biased in saying this, he is a very outstanding doctor. In fact, when I first met him, it was in a room full of doctors and my back was turned to him while I was coloring on the floor at the age of four. He came up to me and asked me if I wanted to work for him. <laughs> and I said, no. <laughs> but here I am today presenting for him, so in a way, I have ended up working for him. <laughs> Dr. Emmanuel Mino, everyone. Thank you so much. That was really the best introduction I had. Um, you know, it's so nice to see patients, you know, getting transformed over time and see their life, uh, you know, move on. I'm very proud of you, so, because I know it's difficult. Uh, so I will talk uh, about uh, narcolepsy and hypersomnia research. And uh, so I, I think, What's the good news is that we really are at a time where science has never been as good as ever. So that's one of the most positive aspects of, re of research right now. There's a revolution in genetics, there is a revolution in proteomics, there is a revolution in wearable machine learning. <clears throat> Nowadays you cannot even breathe without hearing someone, there's artificial intelligence that's going to replace you. And it's, uh, so there's clearly a lot of things going on, and it's, it's going to be a very exciting time for, for research. Now, the problem of uh, hypersomnia is quite complicated, as you will hear, but there is, I think, several avenues that, where we can make quite a bit of a difference. So first, I, I would say that I have a kind of a general bias, which I think is supported by the science, that I don't really distinguish narcolepsy type 2 and IH, for me, they are kind of the same thing. In fact, Dr. Rive was one of the first to publish these uh, papers where when you try to have narcolepsy without cataplexy and you just repeat the MSLT, very often it will switch back and forth between IH and NT2. And we also use the very incredible resource of the uh, Wisconsin Sleep Court to also look at the uh, incident, at the prevalence of, of uh, narcolepsy type 2. And when we looked at people who really had consistently REM abnormalities, like the, you would repeat the MSLT and it was always positive, we found very few that had narcolepsy type 2. Many of them would switch, you know, to something more like idiopathic hypersomnia. So in general, I, I really think that uh, IH and narcolepsy type 2, as far as the current diagnostic criteria, are not, very, are not different <clears throat> and should be treated the same. And I think it's very important that, uh, that uh, they get the same amount of attention in terms of research, et cetera, because they suffer exactly the same way. And NT1, so I think we really know generally the cause, and as you know, it's hypocretin, it's a la lack of this orexin hypocretin. Um, and clearly, uh, there, is, there is a lot there to, uh, to research as well, but it's a much rarer disorder. So the first question I think that everyone asks is, okay, with that, what is, what, what is IH and what is uh, narcolepsy with cataplexy? And that, I will say, is the question of, you know, how, how can you better make sure that someone is narcolepsy type 1 and someone is narcolepsy type 2 and IH? And, you know, the, 
the first thing that uh, we can do is to try to use current sleep studies to try to figure out, you know, a better way to diagnose narcolepsy on, and differentiate it for IH and NT2. And I think there's three different areas that, that are coming, especially with the wearable. One of them is to use more sleep study at night because nowadays there is more and more devices. I mean, you can look where you can actually do sleep at home. There's one that's called uh, Dream, but there are many others that are being developed. So you could imagine one day that instead of going to the lab, they will send you some kind of kit, and then you glue it on yourself, maybe not too, too much, you know? <laughs> and then you sleep for a few nights, and then they will see how your sleep looks like, and I think we'll be able to say, oh, you have NT1, for example, that will probably work quite well for narcolepsy type 1 because people go straight into REM sleep and it's very specific for narcolepsy type 1. For IH, I, we don't know yet if it's going to be helpful because no one has really studied it yet. Uh, another way might be to do this MSLT, MWT, but maybe more of it because, of course, we, we know, as we heard, maybe if we repeat the MSLT several times, you can be sure that someone is NT1, or maybe, as I will show, there might be something inside the sleep or the MSLT, like for NT1, that could help you to diagnose narcolepsy. And then finally, I, I think at some point, I mean, you heard from probably Yves Dovillier, who, who I, I, I often call, he, he brings his patient into a, a jail for like five days, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and then you're absolutely sure that the patient's like idiopathic hypersomnia, but the problem is you don't really know. 90% of the people just that he doesn't know what they have. I'm exaggerating, but I mean, if, if you really define it very strictly, then there's almost no one that meets the criteria. So that's also a problem because you have all these patients that need help, and then if you just, uh, you know, uh, at the end you say, we don't know what you have, I think that's not a solution to offer. So I think trying to study people in their home of environment is critical. We really need to move away from this lab study to being at home and seeing how people behave, what's going on with their life, and really seeing how the sleepiness is really impairing them. So uh, for NT1, the solution is relatively easy. We've done quite a bit of studies now using artificial intelligence and using sleep studies, and we can diagnose by doing some statistics, we can diagnose patients almost as well as the MSLT. So you would just have a sleep study at home and probably measuring the brain wave could say if you have narcolepsy type 1 or not. It's quite accurate, at least as accurate as the MSLT. Uh, but, um, and uh, we, we are adding genetics, for example. So with just one blood sample, we may be able to diagnose patients with NT1 together with the PSG. And really, the, the question that we're asking now is, how can we better diagnose people at scale? Because narcolepsy type 1 is rare. I think idiopathic hypersomnia NT2 is much more common, but it's much more complicated. NT1 is much more rare. So the question is, how can we find a needle in an ASAC? How can we find the narcoleptics in the population? So we need a way to screen very large number of people. And the solution is probably going to be a combination of very simple uh, tools, like, for example, actigraphy, or again, this EEG, plus a blood sample for genetics. And I think we are trying to figure out what will be the best combination of things that we could use large scale to find narcoleptic patients out of 100,000 people. Um, I also want to point out that the MSLT itself, not just the PSG, but the MSLT itself has not been looked enough, even for IH. Uh, we, for example, did some study where we took people with NT1, narcolepsy type 2, and IH, and then we did, did some machine learning to try to see if inside the NAPs there were some differences between people with IH, idiopathic hypersomnia, or NT2, or NT1. And indeed, we found that even by studying the NAPs, we can actually find uh, differences between, uh, uh, you know, for example, narcolepsy type 2 and narcolepsy type 1. So clearly, uh, even studying the MSLT could maybe find new, new biomarkers for IH or idiopathic hypersom for IH or NT2. And the key here, I, in my opinion, is that we know we cannot distinguish them. So we have to figure out, but we know that there are subtypes. I mean, it's not like everyone has the same problem. I mean, we heard some patients, they say it, it fluctuates, it goes up and down. For other people, it's very severe all the time. For some people, it's very subjective. 
You know, you look at the uh, ESS and it's very, very high. They're tired all the time. But then when you do an MSLT, they have trouble falling asleep. But they feel that their cognition is very impaired. And other people, they fall asleep in two minutes. And other people, they have a lot of difficulty waking up in the morning. So there's definitely a lot of different, probably a lot of subtype of IH and narcolepsy type 2. And we have to find other way to distinguish them. And if we could find with machine learning some kind of biomarker in naps or in the sleep studies, it would be very, uh, very, um, I think, exciting. Unfortunately, the problem we have with idiopathic hypersomnia and narcolepsy type 2 is often we don't have enough uh, clinical data that goes with a biomarker. For example, you know, I would love to have all this MSLT data and know everyone that had sleep inertia. Or after each naps, who feels really very difficult to, to, to wake up? Maybe when we look at the brain waves, we would detect something that represents you know, sleep inertia and that really help us to understand what is the problem that underlies why people have so much trouble waking up. And I think we need to really go into that direction. I think for NT1, you know, we know for sure that uh, the MSLT works, but that the, it's not you know, that useful. And the, for NT2 or IH, it probably the MSLT is not that useful. Uh, it only shows a short sleep latency, but whether or not people have SOREM doesn't really make a big deal. And for NT1, I think we need to move towards like trying to screen very large population to find the rare cases that have NT1 because it's much less frequent than idiopathic hypersomnia or NT2. And we need to find a way to move to uh, uh, ambulatory modality, either like EEGs that people can wear at home or even possibly actigraphy. You know, you all have like uh, rings and stuff. I'm sure you, you all have rings and, and watches and so forth. And actually, you know, some of those could be very useful to see the sleep and wake patterns of, of, of people in a chronic way. I don't think it will be enough. And that's why my big uh, you know, idea now is to try what's called multimodal predictions, is trying to uh, use many different modalities to try to diagnose people. So for example, for NT1, we have a big study right now where we have I've succeeded, actually, I've succeeded to uh, convince uh, uh, a big uh, uh, epidemiological uh, sample that's called the UK Biobank, it's in, in the United Kingdom, and they have record, they have 500,000 people, and they have taken blood samples from them, and for 100,000, they have actigraphy. So they have people who have worn like a little bracelet that measure all their sleep, their patterns of activity, and you can derive partially sleep and wake, and then they have questionnaires, and I've asked them to put a lot of questions about sleep and sleepiness, and including cataplexy, and now they are just releasing the data. It took me like probably five years to convince them and three years to do it. But now finally the data is going to be out. And that's going to really help, I think, understand better people who have really severe sleepiness and also find people who have narcolepsy type 1. But for example, if we look at cataplexy, there are very simple questions about cataplexy. Do you file, uh, you know, do you, I, when you're excited, do you feel weak when you're laughing? But we know that even when you ask that to the general population to explain the difficulty, we have about 0.3% of the population that will say yes. That seems, or actually no, sorry, more like 2% will say yes. And 2% is a lot more than narcolepsy, so it's not sufficient. But then they have also this 100,000 with actigraphy, and then they have the genetic. So we hope that by using these three modalities, we might actually find the few narcoleptics that exist in the entire court. So that's a general idea of trying to use different modalities and then merge the probabilities together. And I think the same at, at some point will be very useful to do for idiopathic hypersomnia. But I think for hypersomnia, the most important, for, for my opinion, narcolepsy type 1, we understand what it is. I think we know, we have some good idea to screen for it. My, my dream would be just to find a blood sample, then we'll be gone, we'll be done. There will be nothing else to do, we'll just take a blood sample and boom, we will have no problem diagnosing narcolepsy type 1. But then for idiopathic hypersomnia or narcolepsy type 2, which in my opinion are the same, I think we really need to understand better what's the cause of the problem and if there are different subtypes. And there are several ways we can do it. One of them, which has not been enough, I think is studying the EG itself. 
uh, during these symptoms. I mean, I think a lot of you, if you have idiopathic hypersomnia, you experience brain fog, for example. But what is brain fog? We don't have a clue. I mean, it's just these difficulties, you know, like being able to process things and feeling like, you know, abnormal, but it's, it's not very clear. And for example, if you use EEG, at the time where people report brain fog, maybe we can train a, a machine learning programs that will automatically recognize brain fog because there might be something in the EEG, maybe the EEG is a little bit slower, and maybe that this way we can say, oh, this person really has objective sign for something like brain fog. Similarly for sleep inertia, when you look at the very old literature, you know, what is sleep inertia? The classic idea is that people wake up but they are a little bit like sleepwalking. You know, it's, it's I mean, the equivalent of sleepwalking. They are half in slow wave sleep and half awake. And then maybe when you measure the EEGs, they will have more slow wave, like if they were half sleeping, a little bit like what you will see in sleepwalking, this dissociation where people are half asleep and half awake. But this is papers that have been done in the 1970s. There have been absolutely no work whatsoever in this area for the last, I don't know, 50 years, which is very sad because if we could recognize, have real you know, measure of these symptoms, I think we could really go somewhere in terms of the cause of this problem. Um, so I think we're, we are doing a little bit of work in that area, but again, the big problem is we don't have data. I mean, data is king, you know, I, I think David and I, we are both smart, and, but we don't, have in, we don't have data. There is almost no data on idiopathic hypersomnia uh, really well uh, recorded. It's starting a little bit in Europe, it's available, but not that much in the US. Um, another thing that uh, I, I, I kind of feel uh, uh, strongly is uh, proteomics, which I will discuss, uh, because I think uh, there is a question about idiopathic hypersomnia and narcolepsy type 2 about, is that because people are sleepy because they don't sleep enough at night? You know, maybe their sleep is not restorative. You know, they need more sleep than other people, it's never strong enough, and that's why maybe Zyram is effective in some people. But in other cases, maybe they are not awake enough during the day. We don't know. Or maybe it's a circadian clock that's not working. And we really don't know even this very basic uh, cause of, of sleepiness in, in patients with idiopathic hypersomnia. Um, so in my opinion, at least if I had an agenda to do, is I like genetic analysis because genetics I mean, I, I always say to people in my lab, when you are desperate, just do genetics, because it kind of always works. You know, it may take a large sample, so that's a problem. For idiopathic hypersomnia or narcolepsy type 2, maybe you will need 5,000 people, because it's not like narcolepsy. But I think you will start to get clues about the cause of idiopathic hypersomnia and the different subtypes. Um, so, but for NT1, just to finish NT1, I think what we need to do mostly is to find a blood sample. That would be the best. If we could find a, a way to diagnose narcolepsy with a blood sample, that would be my dream, because then you know, all these tests will go away. And maybe finding T cells or autoantibodies, because we know it's an autoimmune disease. There is another question that we need to figure out is what's the spectrum of NT1. There's still a very small number of NT2 that are actually NT1 in disguise. Then when you measure the apocretin or rexin, they have low levels. And there's probably more in the general population than we see at the clinic, uh, because they don't go to see the physician. They just nap a little bit more, and they don't, don't seem to care that much. And I, I really think we need to do a lot more genetics uh, you know, in this general area, and maybe find blood biomarker. Um, now for NT2, I think you know, we are starting to get this big data set from, for example, the UK Biobank, that gives us some general idea of people reporting being tired or having circadian rhythm, being early bird. I mean, another question that always I've been striking to me is that a lot of patients with idiopathic hypersomnia have problem waking up in the morning. And you all know that another group of patients that have problem waking up in the morning are like delayed sleep phase syndrome. It's people who, like, I'm sure you have, some of you have uh, adolescents, and they just can't wake up in the morning. They have idiopathic hypersomnia. <laughs> I mean, I'm exaggerating, but very often, at least in the morning, they are really bad. So there's clearly a possibility that some of the symptoms of idiopathic hypersomnia are due to the fact that the circadian timing of people is abnormal, and that has not been looked at enough. 
And one of the ways to attack it, again, is to look at the genetics, because in this very large database, people have already looked at the genes that predispose to being a morning, a morning bird or a night owl or being, uh, you know, and there are also some uh, genetic factors that have been reported to be associated with just sleeping many hours or being more tired uh, in general. And I think we could look at patients with idiopathic hypersomnia if we had like five or 10,000 and then look at the overlap with this very large sample and really see what is different and what is common. One question that I wanted to answer that was asked to uh, David, uh, which was, I think, interesting, is the genetics of uh, uh, idiopathic hypersomnia or narcolepsy without cataplexy. Actually, a very while, a while ago, uh, when narcolepsy type 2 and, and narcolepsy type 1 were not very differentiated, there were a, a studies that was done by uh, Cephalon and they asked to about 800 people, more than 800 people, about family history <clears throat> of narcolepsy. And actually, interestingly, the family history was higher in the people that didn't have the HLA or the NT2 than in the NT1. So I do believe that there is quite a strong genetic factor probably that, uh, you know, associated with idiopathic hypersomnia or narcolepsy uh, without cataplexy. And, uh, and also syndromes that we look at quite a bit which uh, <clears throat> is very interesting, it's called Klein-Levin syndrome. It's a very particular subtype of hypersomnia where people are like hypersomnia, but much worse. They can't even wake up, they can't even stand up, and they are really in a fog, they cannot concentrate, they almost cannot talk, and then um, it lasts for like 10 or 20 days, and then boom, it's finished. So it fluctuates tremendously, but it's very, very strong when it happens, and they are completely normal in between episodes. And I think it's also a very nice model. I mean, I, I, we heard that for some people, narcolepsy, uh, uh, idiopathic hypersomnia fluctuates as well. But in these cases, it's very, very dramatic. And what we found is we kind of did the genetic studies, and we found that the the highest uh, genes that was associated with this disorder was a gene that's also associated with bipolar disorder. And what's interesting about that is that bipolar disorder, also when you look at the genetic of bipolar disorder, you actually find that uh, the, the genes that predispose to bipolar disorder also predispose to hypersomnia in this very large population. So I think there is some overlap at some level between uh, something that's more like bipolar and being very tired and needing a lot of sleep. Uh, but that has not been explored. And it has a very strong genetic effect. And when we studied this particular uh, disorder, and so we found that there were strong genetic components, that there was this association with one gene that was very important for bipolar, and we found also that there were association with genes that predispose to circadian, abnormal circadian rhythm. Uh, like being a morning person or an evening person. And uh, interestingly, this particular uh, uh, group of, of patients are reactive to lithium. And then more recently, there is a, a student in, in uh, Chicago, a physician in Chicago, that has shown that a melatonin agonist called Ramelteon can also be very helpful. Like if they take it every evening, it seems to help these people not to relapse and have these big episodes of hypersomnia. And I mean, that's all, again, another uh, thing that I've always been curious about is even what could be the effect of lithium or, or this drug in patients with hypersomnia. Uh, I think it should probably be looked at. I've, my experience is that a lot of patients with idiopathic hypersomnia or narcolepsy without cataplexy are often diagnosed with depression in, first, or at least, even if they're not diagnosed with depression, the, the doctors don't do know what to do, so they give them an antidepressant all the time. <laughs> so you come, you'd say, oh, I'm tired all the time, blah, 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 blah. The first thing they do is they give you an antidepressant. And usually it doesn't work at all. I mean, sometimes people are depressed and it improves their depression, but the sleepiness remains. So I think, uh, and I've always been curious about lithium because I have some patients with some form of idiopathic hypersomnia and lithium that have been, uh, you know, improved, uh, and it helps uh, people with uh, Klein-Levin syndrome. The problem is it's not a very easy drug to use. It has a, a, a number of, of some toxicity. So what should we, what I believe we should do for idiopathic hypersomnia and NT2, 
I personally believe we should do a genetic study to try to understand you know, what portion is due to circadian problem, what portion is due to sleep, uh, you know, core sleep homeostasis issue, like having trouble find, you know, staying awake and, and, and having trouble weight promotion or, or not sleeping enough, and probably having better phenotyping. Um, and then the second thing I feel strongly about, or at least that's what I'm doing right now because that's easy, <laughs> or it's easier, uh, is proteomics, because you all know that genes are what you inherit and they cause, you know, the, but, but they are often accounting only for a small portion of, of a disease. Like for example, let's say cardiovascular risk, you know, if you look at your cardiovascular risk, you have genetic factors that make you more at risk of having a heart attack, but they only account for a small portion of the problem. Uh, but if you start to measure cholesterol, then it, yes, it accounts for a much bigger uh, portion of the risk. It's much closer to the disease. And the proteomics is a little bit the same thing. You can look at, and, but, however, what's important is that the genes that regulate the level of cholesterol are also associated with the disease. So cholesterol can be regulated by what you eat, but also by your genes. And, and the genes are associated with, with uh, heart attack, but cholesterol is even more associated with heart attack, and the gene associated with cholesterol. So you kind of know that it's a causal pathway. The gene can modulate cholesterol, that modulate you know, heart attack. That's a little bit what we want to find in these diseases, something that's at the level of the gene that changes something in proteins, and that changes, and the level of protein change is associated with idiopathic hypersomnia, for example, because then we'll know that it's causal. And it, it, there is a new revolution now, because before we were only able to measure a few proteins, but now you can measure 10,000 of protein in 100 microliter. So it's kind of amazing, and it, it's really changing everything. And this is what I was explaining. What's nice about proteins is they're much closer to the cause of problems. You know, the genes is nice, but they often account for a very small effect. The big advantage of genes is they're always causal, you know, because you cannot change your gene. So if you have hypersomnia, your gene are not going to change. So if you find genes that are associated with hypersomnia, it means the gene caused the hypersomnia, even if it's a very small risk. So that's a big advantage. Whereas if I measure something in blood and you have hypersomnia and it's different with controls, I don't know if it's because you have hypersomnia and you sleep all the time, so it changes something in the blood, or if the change in the blood that caused the hypersomnia. And of course, it's critical to know the difference. And by studying the gene and the protein at the same time, you can distinguish what's causal and not causal. And that's, I think, what's very exciting. It's trying to use proteomics together with, with, uh, <coughs> together with genetics. Another, uh, I think, exciting, um, I think, areas is if you go back with hypersomnia and, idiop and narcolepsy type 2 and you just say we don't really know the cause of the problem, uh, you have to to say, okay, let's come back maybe to the basics of sleep. What could cause people being tired? So one thing could definitely be their circadian rhythm. I mean, you all experience jet lag, is that right? You have, in some aspect, having hypersomnia is having jet lag permanently. I'm exaggerating, but it's almost like this. So maybe one of the causes could be an abnormal circadian clock. And some people with idiopathic hypersomnia, as I mentioned, sometimes they have trouble waking up in the morning, but the evening it's a little bit better. So maybe there is a component of abnormal circadian rhythm in some patients with idiopathic hypersomnia. REM sleep is very regulated by the circadian rhythm, and some people who have SOREM, like narcolepsy type 2, that could be a bit more circadian. Uh, then it could be that people have problem like waking up, you know, like uh, have problem sleeping, sorry. Uh, that maybe some people just never have enough sleep. I mean, we, there is always that question. If we let a patient with idiopathic hypersomnia sleep for 10 or 20 hours, are they better? I mean, we always ask that question. Generally, the answer is no, but it's very difficult to tell because honestly, being sleep deprived, it can take a very long time to, to remove the sleep debt. We know that there is what's called a chronic sleep debt. And even if you sleep for five or six days, you know, as much as you can, it may not be sufficient to completely remove your, what we call a chronic sleep debt. So it's possible that some of the patients experience this problem because their sleep is fundamentally not good at night. And that's maybe why Zarem helps a lot of patients with, with idiopathic hypersomnia. And we don't know why. Um, the, uh, another cause could be that the people cannot 
be awake. They don't have the systems that help them to stay awake during the day. For example, hypocretin, you know, orexin could be too low in some patients, and maybe doing an orexin agonist will help more than Xyrem in some patients. And all this will manifest the same way. So in my opinion, if we could figure out with a blood sample, is this person more problem with a circadian clock? Is this person more problem with sleep not being good and restorative? Or is this person a problem because they don't have something that helps them to stay awake? It will really help to, to figure out which treatment to give. And right now, we have no way of distinguishing this different mechanism. But I'm working on it using this proteomics, and I'm very optimistic that it's going to work eventually. Because what's really amazing is, again, now you can measure this. Uh, we can measure 11,000 different proteins in 100 microliters of blood. The problem is it's really damn expensive. That's the only problem. <laughs> but it's going to decrease in price. It's like the genetic. You know, when I started, it was you know, $500 a, a sample. Now it's like $10. You know? So eventually, it will become low. And uh, um, for example, with these proteins, we have been able right now to measure circadian rhythm. It's very complicated. You have to measure the melatonin, and you have to keep people in the dark and measure melatonin and see how it rises in the middle of the night. It's very inconvenient. And in fact, I don't know of any studies that have looked at melatonin onset in patients with idiopathic hypersomnia or narcolepsy type 2. And probably you would need a large sample, but still, it's very time consuming. But with this measuring this 10,000 protein, because we see which one are high and low, and they just come up at different time in the circadian clock. We can actually derive the circadian time if people are, uh, have a, a night, very night owl or very early bird just with one blood sample. And then even better, you see it's very interesting to see which protein change at which time of the day. We know that the role of the circadian clock is to help you to stay awake in the, in the evening and to stay uh, asleep in the, uh, in the late night. The way it works is in the morning, you wake up, you have no sleep debt because you just slept. So in theory, in a normal person, you're rested in the morning because you're just rested, because you just had good sleep. And then as the day progresses, you should be more and more sleep deprived. Because, and then towards the evening, you have another thing, which is a circadian clock, and you see this big peak of proteins that are being secreted that helps you to stay awake in spite of the fact that you have just uh, been awake for quite a long time. And that's why when you go to a foreign country, uh, this is the evening that you cannot sleep. You know, your local evening, you cannot sleep because there is this circadian drive for alertness. And then when you fall asleep, this drops, and then the first period of sleep, you get this slow wave sleep. You, you get a lot of, you catch up on your sleep debt. And then after a few hours, sometimes you even wake up in the, a little bit, and then the, the circadian drive for sleep is going to go on, and then you go, your temperature goes down, and then you get a lot of REM sleep. So basically, you should really divide the day and the night in four quarters. The beginning of the day, you are awake because you just rested. You have no sleep debt. The evening, you're awake because your circadian clocks tells you to be awake. The early night, you sleep well because you're sleep, you have a sleep debt. You catch up on the fact that you're tired. And the second part of the night, you sleep because your circadian clock tells you to sleep extra. And you can imagine that when you start to think like this, you know, maybe we really need to look at idiopathic hypersomnia in a different way. And we are, we are creating these models where we can measure with one blood sample you know, if the people are a night owl or early bird, if the shift of their clock is completely abnormal. And we're using mathematical modeling also to measure both chronic sleep debt and acute sleep debt. You know, because sleep debt, like, is, of course, if you don't sleep one night, you're very tired. But we also know that it's very different from chronic sleep debt. If you sleep every night, like, only five hours, you accumulate something that's very different from the acute sleep debt that you cannot recover in one night. And we are starting to find very specific proteins that reflect chronic or acute sleep debt. So what I'm hoping, I think it's feasible one day, is to take a blood sample, and then I can say, oh, this person at this time is tired because their circadian clock is, is really out of phase, and or they haven't slept enough, and they have a chronic and an acute sleep debt. And that could really help, I think, in the future to tailor each treatment. That's my dream, but I know it's a little bit uh, so I, in my, I'm, yeah, no, I think it will work, but it's going to take a, uh, a little bit of time. But it's, it's work, I think it's starting to work. And I think eventually what I'm hoping is we will be able to take a blood sample and someone with NT2 NIH will say, oh, this person, the problem is 
their circadian clock. And then in that case, we'll probably use much more light or melatonin or remelteon. And if it's another problem, like not being awake enough, it will be more anorexin agonist or stimulant. And for another person, to sleep is not good enough, it will be more Xyrem or something that really makes them sleep more. I think that's how what, what we have to do. But it's really the, only the beginning. And I want to point out, of course, that would be one of my last slides, that it's really exciting that uh, you know, now, I think the big change in idiopathic hypersomnia and narcolepsy type 2 has been the efficacy of Zarem. I mean, that's just amazing. I don't know if some of you have idiopathic hypersomnia or, or um, NT2, but for a while we were using sodium oxybate only for, uh, for uh, NT1, and now we are really realizing that it's helping a lot of people with NT2 and IH, and we don't really know why. Um, I think that suggests that a lot of people don't have good sleep at night, and they really need a deeper sleep at night as one of the cause. So in conclusion, I think for NT1, we need a better, if I could have a dream, it would be a blood biomarker. Then we'll get rid of our accent deficiency, we can take a blood sample, boom, everyone it will be diagnosed very quickly, but it's easier said than done. And for narcolepsy type 2 and idiopathic hypersomnia, I mean, it is really a can of worm. I mean, it, I don't think we can distinguish them, and we have to just forget about the old definition and try to figure out other ways to understand idiopathic hypersomnia. And in my opinion, we should do in the directions that I, I, I suggest, like which one are circadian, which one are insufficient wakefulness, which one have a sleep debt, are chronically sleep deprived, and then tailor the treatment to these different signatures. And I think proteomics is the way to go. But also we could use actigraphy, I think, and other methods to study how their sleep and wake are. And I think that would be very enlightening. I still believe in genetics because it's always causal. Uh, but I think we need a lot of, don't, don't expect that it will work with 1,000 people. We need like 5,000 or 3,000 people. But it's feasible. I mean, now it's, it's $50 to do a, a genetic study. And then we will start to find uh, uh, things. So this is, this is uh, what I wanted to, to say. So that I think there is a combination of both like new devices, uh, proteomics, and genetics that, that is going to, I think, help to differentiate subtype of NT2 and IH uh, from NT1, which is already well defined. And I think that will really give us a, a much better tool to use existing drugs or even design new drugs for treating patients with this problem. Thank you so much. What an amazing presentation. Thank you, Dr. Mignot. We have a couple of questions from our online viewers. I'm going to combine these two into one. Are you aware of any research around wasp venom or bio neurofeedback, excuse me, to treat sleep inertia in idiopathic hypersomnia? So wasp venom, no. Uh, I, no, I, don't, I really don't know of anything. Now for uh, biofeedback, it's an interesting, I mean, I think another elephant in the room that I've not really talked too much about is the relation between idiopathic hypersomnia, narcolepsy type two and depression. You know, everyone says, oh, it's depression, but without being sad, you know? So that's what usually psychiatrists, when they see people complain of being tired all the time, they don't know what to do. So they say, oh, it's depression, and they give them an antidepressant. The problem is it usually doesn't work, but then the people are still on antidepressant. And yet we have heard, even from the audience, that a lot of people will say that, for example, when they get more stressed, they get more sleepy. You know, there is definitely a relationship also with some psychiatric uh, symptoms in patients with idiopathic hypersomnia. But it's very difficult to tell, is it the, you know, the, uh, the cause or the effect? You know? And uh, because you know, I, it's, it's just impossible. It's just the same, it's the same thing. And we see that, for example, with uh, Zyrem. I had patients, you know, they really get completely transformed with, with, uh, with Zyrem, with idiopathic hypersomnia, and yet, you know, all antidepressants and so forth. And some of them had depression before. Some of them didn't have depression. But there's clearly some relationship because we all have only one brain. And that's another thing I think we need to really understand better. I guess I'm not answering the question, which I don't even remember what it was. It was the venom. It was the venom, and what was the second one? About biofeedback. Oh, yes, yeah, the, the biofeedback. So, yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I was going somewhere. I just forgot in the way. 
It's just uh, another thing that I found quite interesting is it's a little bit the same problem with insomnia. We know that insomnia is, is, is something that develops very slowly and definitely it has a relationship with psychiatric issues, but often it starts by being subjective. You know, people, you know, you don't have an objective tiredness. You, you, it's not like you have an objective way of, of uh, you don't sleep poorly. You just, uh, um, objectively you sleep normally, but you think you are sleeping poorly. It's called subjective uh, insomnia. It's kind of called sleep state misperception. But then as people progress, I wouldn't be surprised that it becomes objective. Kind of, and I think there is a training component to it. You know, when you start to to not sleep well, even subjectively, then it becomes subjective after a while. And I always wonder if it's not a little bit the same thing for some of the idiopathic hypersomnia. First, you have a high Epworth, and then little by little, you know, you, you start to develop even an abnormal MSLT, uh, and and maybe that's partially behavioral, something you train yourself doing. But it's just an idea, so. I'm always open to anything that people do to uh, try to change their behavior. But most people, they need drugs. I think it still helps them to, to get back on the right path. You know. Okay, over here. So I have a question. I am IH, and as I've gotten older, I mean, your sleeping patterns change naturally as you age. It's very common for older people just to fall asleep. And I appreciate the foundation and all the education and trying to separate the different parts of sleepiness, but the part where you're not sleeping deeply and these new drugs help you to sleep deeply, what is the difference between those and the people who can't sleep that are on sleep-promoting medicines? Because I know more people who can't sleep that take sleeping pills. So how are those different than sleeping pills. Now that's a good point. So, um, so sleeping, the sleeping medications, uh, you know, there, there are many different types now. One of them are called benzodiazepines, which basically reduce stress and, uh, you know, they are the old, very old Valium type. And even like Zolpidem and so forth, they are the same way. They are relatively mild. And I, I mean, I don't think they really help that much people with idiopathic hypersomnia. Uh, then you have a uh, sleeping pill like orexin antagonist, but uh, I, I, we, they haven't been tried in idiopathic hypersomnia. But then the one that's been tried is Zarem is definitely a different category altogether. It's really, really strong. So, in fact, the first time I, I discovered Zarem, I was in medical school, and at the time people were taking it to sleep very deeply when they were in between the shifts because you could sleep for three hours and you were sleeping so deeply that you would wake up very refreshed. So I think Zyrem is definitely different, or Zyrem or sodium oxybate or oxybate is definitely different from other sleeping pills because it produces very dense sleep and it seems to reduce more your sleep, your sleep debt. And the feeling you have with this compound is that people feel more and more rested. And even for narcolepsy type one, it's a little strange because we give it to them, they, they often don't sleep well at night, and often the benefits are only manifesting after, you know, like a month or two months of administration because it seems like it, it makes them maybe lower their chronic sleep debt. You know, again, I, I, I think there's a difference between being acutely sleep deprived and chronically sleep deprived. For, and, and, I, I, and I think there are some people it's not like they don't sleep well one night, it's that they haven't been well, sleeping well for a very long time, and that has accumulated some, some debt that still makes them very tired. I don't know if I explained that better. And I think this drug like Zyrem has made more effect on, on this type of processes. And of course, if we had a biomarker, that would be even better because we could look at what's happening with this drug and these biomarkers, which would be fantastic. But I hope I will get there one day. So different sleeping pills uh, have completely different mechanism. But right now, at least, only the, the sodium oxybate has been shown to be effective in idiopathic hypersomnia. Dr. Mignot, I'm over here. I'm curious, uh, with the orexin hypocretin deficiencies that are seen traditionally in narcolepsy type 1, and with the fact that Zywave is an oxibate medication. 
has, what's your opinion about, while we may not be deficient in hypocrete neurorexin, do you have any thoughts about whether it's a communication, a functional communication issue uh, with the neurotransmitter orexin hypocretin? Does that make sense? Yes, no. Okay. What, no, what <laughs> not always asking. good at getting my thoughts out. No, I think what you're asking is, is it possible that orexin hypocretin is important for people with IH as well? You know, we know that for narcolepsy type 1, it's important because you don't have it. But, you know, as a, is it important for idiopathic hypersomnia? It's difficult to tell because I don't think there have been enough studies. It could be that it's functionally not working as well. That's very possible. But we, and I suspect it's probably part of the story. And that probably in some patients, giving an agonist, you know, like the drugs that's going to be used for NT1, will really help them a lot. But uh, we don't know. What I see with IH and idiopathic uh, and, and narcolepsy type 2, in the past, I used to use a lot of stimulants, right? Like, a, amphetamine, blah, 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 blah. And sometimes it works, but very often it doesn't work that well. Like people, after a while, it's just they get used to it, and it seems that the problems comes back, you know, and then you have to increase the dose. That's why usually I use the long term, and then it's a long lasting, because otherwise there is even more problems, there is addiction problem, but it kind of helps, but really it's not transformative, and then it's often, you know, they want more. You know, it seems to never work. So I, I don't like, I, I was with, with a sodium, oxy, with oxybate, I think often you really get a much more pro profound transformation if people have IH and react well to it, but not everyone reacts well to it. And for our agonist, we are going to discover these drugs are being developed for type one narcolepsy. They definitely are different. You know, people are more awake, but they don't have as much agitation as the, the dopamine drugs where people are kind of a little bit like robotic. Like people here are more calm and more focused. So we'll see, maybe they will work better on some cases of idiopathic hypersomnia. You know, all the science I told you about, it's very nice, but it's also very nice to have new drugs to try <laughs> because that really works immediately and we'll, we'll, we'll learn. But what I'm pretty certain is it will help some patients and not others. And what we need is to find a way to separate the different types of patients to, to see what works best, you know. But it's a very exciting time for, because there's all this new medication and I think it's a, it's a time to be hopeful. Okay, another question over here. Has there been genetic testing to see if various neurological disorders are hereditary, like IH, schizophrenia, that type of thing? No, I, I don't know of any real good studies that has looked at the genetics of IH. I mentioned this little side, like on this clinical trial. Now, I, I was very happy to see that David De Planty mentioned Bederich Schroth, who is my, uh, one of my heroes. He was a very, uh, uh, very amazing personality in the Czech Republic. He's the one that really baptized idiopathic hypersomnia. And he really claims that it was very genetic. He had a lot of large families, and I think if you speak to Yves Dovilliers, they also have families of patients with idiopathic hypersomnia. So I do believe there are strong genetic factors, but it's not because it's familial that it's necessarily very one gene, you know? Like, you know, cardiovascular disease, like myself, for example, my father had all kind of cardiovascular issues, and, you know, I, I'm sure that I'm at risk of cardiovascular disease, and that's much more, you know, it doesn't mean that it's just one gene, you know? So uh, I, I really believe, and, and the, the KLS data, the Klein-Levin syndrome data, suggests that there were very strong genetic factors, but not just one, a whole group of them. So I think it's a very promising direction, but we, just, we don't know anything. I mean, nobody has done any work on this, unfortunately. It's time to do it, actually, <laughs> really. I'm going to do the proteomics in idiopathic hypersomnia, for sure because I'm, I'm doing it right now. In fact, uh, I got the funding to do it, so I'm very happy about that. Um, and we'll see what we get, but it's a small sample. Um, but uh, the genetics, it needs a lot more. You know, we probably need uh, thousands of people. But I think you have a lot of people, so it wouldn't be very difficult to, to set that up. Uh, good morning, I have a question regarding you just said not just one gene. 
um, if a person has cataplexy but they're not testing for an M, uh, MSLT for narcolepsy, uh, is there a possibility another gene that's causing the cataplexy? So they're testing IH, not narcolepsy type 1, but have definite cataplexy? So what's really amazing in medicine is you can see anything. You know, I mean, it's, there's always an exception to any rule, that's for sure. Like, uh, we know that people with low Rx in their CSF are pretty much all the time HLA positive. I haven't seen one for a very long time that end up being HLA negative. Uh, but I know they occur because I've seen at least like five or six, and I have, some of my colleagues have found them. So there's always exceptions. So in general, cataplexy by itself is really associated with, uh, with narcolepsy type 1. But we have, I have a, maybe a, no, a few, I mean, across different um, uh, samples, because I collaborate a lot with the French, the Chinese, everybody. <laughs> and uh, we, I think we have assembled like maybe five, maybe 100 or 200 cases. We have cataplexy, but the normal orexin, and we don't really know what they are, and uh, we will probably do some genetic studies on them to see if we find something, but I'm not sure. One of the difficulties with cataplexy is still a subjective symptom, and people may report something a little bit like cataplexy, but you know, it's very difficult to know what it is. I don't know if I'm answering completely the question, but every disorder has a little bit of uh, gray zone, gray area, which we don't understand. That's really what my, my answer would be. And we are trying to study those, but right now we don't understand them. Thank you so much. Thank you.